most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In this episode, we are going to have a conversation with Sarah Magruder. She is the founder of Sapphire Oil & Gas Consultant, a tax consultant group based in Houston, Texas, helping oil and gas companies. Good morning, Sarah. You are the founder of Sapphire Oil and Guys Consultant, a consultant group that tries to minimize stress and maximize op- opportunities, which is I never heard of before, which is super excited to know more about you and also the work you have been doing. How did you get into the industry? So I got into the oil and gas industry completely by chance out of college. Um, the, uh, I took a job with a consulting firm and they mainly did sales tax. Um, but at the time they bought a severance tax practice, uh, which was oil and gas. And I got invited to be on that team. And so I just stumbled into it a year out of college and have been doing, doing it ever since. Wow. So how do you like it so far? I love it. You know, a lot of people say that uh, um, accounting in oil and gas is is not the most riveting subject, but I really enjoy it because I I like to solve puzzles. I like to figure things out. I like to save people money. I like to help my clients. So it's just something I've become passionate about and learned a lot about and grown with over the past 20 years um, from starting in this as, as an employee to starting my own consulting company to, to handle it. So I really enjoy this field and, and all the people that are in it. <laughs> so after decades of experience in the oil and, and gas industry, what prompted you to take a leap toward entrepreneurship? It was something I had been thinking about for quite some time. And, um, you know, you, you have marriages, you have a child, you have life changes that, that kind of um, put your decisions in certain ways where you want stability and to do that. So it was just the right time to take a risk. And, uh, you know, my my son was older and my husband had an established job. And it it just was a time when I was given an opportunity to do that and decided to jump and take that risk um, of timing. But it's something I thought about for um, the past 20 years uh, and, and, Tickled with doing myself, it just, I I finally felt like I was in the right place and time to pull that trigger. Wow. And also, I think that um, the fact that also your son is older and then also your husband have a stable job, if anything happened, it's kind of like, we're going to be okay. Exactly. That's exactly right. You have to, you have to feel secure when, when you take that leap or it's easier if you do. I agree with you on that. So I love the name Sapphire. It's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, the, the name behind it, I felt like you're choosing it for a purpose. So can you tell us why? Sure. We, we did choose it for a purpose. And what, what nobody tells you is how hard it is to come up with a company name. <laughs> you know, you, when, you, when you decide to take that leap, then it, this is important because it's something your brand's going to be, be built around. You want to explain it to people. You want it to have meaning. So we, we kicked a lot around quite a few different ones. A lot of them were very much uh, women empowerment, women warriors, women princesses, you know. And, um, and it, it just, you know, we were trying to find something that, that, uh, that really tied in more to the accounting in oil and gas. So how we came up with Sapphire is I, of course, love sparkly jewels and, and sparkly things. And the Sapphire is a gem. But we we re we re uh, formed the word to S A F I R E, and the reason is because it is a combination of safe and fiery. So um, it, it kind of goes to de, to describe our style, which is what I would call conservatively aggressive. We want to do what is within the confines of the law and be conservative and in our approach with our clients and our dealings. But we're also a little bit fiery and we've got a a little bit of attitude and and um, and take an aggressive approach to save our clients as much as we can and to kind of step outside that boundary. So it has a dual meaning and that's why our 
logo is a yellow sapphire. Right. Is it's representative of of something that is rare and unique and and has a lot of good qualities like that. That's a little bit different. And and being a woman led business in the oil and gas industry is a little bit unique. And we decided to just embrace that instead of uh, try to be like everybody else. We said no. We're going to be sparkly and fun and and have a, a yellow sapphire as our logo and have bright colors and and put ourselves out there, which is uh, very much not the norm in in accounting or in oil and gas. So we we just embrace that. But but the the name has a lot of meaning. <laughs> it's different, and different is special. <laughs> yes, that was the goal. <laughs> so. Can you tell us about the company or um, what is it about, the services that you offer and then all the great stuff behind it? Sure. So I, I like to kind of describe us as TurboTax for the oil and gas industry. So what, what we do is, is go in and analyze um, in, in oil and gas, every state has uh, regulation of state taxes you have to pay on anything you extract or sever from the earth. So that's why it's called a severance tax. And then we also deal in royalties, which are um, interests that the state or the federal government or Indian sovereign nations own in the oil and gas produced as well. So what our company specializes in and what, what my team is great at is going in and every state has certain exemptions and deductions that they allow um, to entice people to come and drill in their state. And they, they're also incentivizing them to produce energy cleanly. You know, there, there's incentives for all kinds of things. And um, so that's what we know we know best. So like in TurboTax, if you're doing your own taxes and you go in there and it says, if you drive a, a blue Prius from 1997, you get a credit of $100, you know. We essentially know that on the oil and gas side is, we know what exemptions and what tax deductions that oil and gas companies can take um, against their state severance taxes. So they're only paying what they're meant to pay. So we do this in two, two ways. We can go back and do a refund review and see if they've overpaid and recover that for them. But we do a lot of tax planning as well um, in figuring out how to structure things and, and have processes in place to make sure that they're doing this going forward, which helps their bottom line. So we work with everybody from small mom and pop oil and gas companies to global super major, you know, um, oil and gas companies. And, and each of them has their own challenges and, uh, and interesting things. So like I said, it's a puzzle that we piece together, but my team really specializes in um, knowing all those exemptions and deductions and ways to, to help and dig into the, the data. So you, you're not just going in to do the taxes, it's making sure that also everything else is in place and then the deduction that's available to them and uh, anything else that can be beneficial to the company to, to help them grow at the same time. Correct, yes. Do you find it difficult when it's come to the oil and gas or for when it's come to tax, a little bit more tricky? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, the thing with oil and gas accounting is nothing ever stays the same. Um, uh, oil and gas, there's a lot of merger and acquisition activity where companies are buying each other. So properties mm. and data is transferring. Anytime that happens, there can be a... Um, a fall off in the knowledge transfer, uh, the exemptions taken. So it's a very dynamic industry in that state. You also have the people who are changing that do the roles and their knowledge base depends on how well they're doing their jobs. Um, and then you throw in uh, if somebody does a software conversion or brings in a new software. So there's, there's so many outside elements that can impact the accuracy of these reports um, that uh, there will essentially always, it's, it's hard to have it perfect at any time. And it, it's, it's really tough in today's day and age. So uh, you have to be very adaptable, a very dynamic with the industry. You know, I, I say we, we find a new way every day that somebody can do something we haven't seen before. And uh, so it's, it's fun. It's fun um, figuring out and solving those problems. But at the, the end of the day, what we're doing is math, you know, where we're, we're we're not dealing with people's lives or anything. So it's right. something that can be calculated, fixed, substantiated. Um, so there is, a, a, there is a right answer to be found. 
Got you. But do you also work with, let's say, for example, an oil company that's probably in Massachusetts, but also in Florida? So is that common, like the clients that you have? So Massachusetts and Florida are not as common for oil and gas companies. But to your point, um, say there's a Chevron who's headquartered in California, but they have offices and operations all over the country. So we do work in any state that has oil and gas. Now we are um, specifically doing domestic United States oil and gas. We don't do um, anything out of the country at this point or offshore or international. We are pretty, pretty on the domestic side, but we do deal with companies that have um, several different um, entities under them and they may be in various different states. So the complexity of that does change. And, and like I said, with the mergers and acquisitions, you'll have a company up in Pennsylvania that buys an asset in Texas and they know nothing about Texas. So they need to learn and they need to, to help with that transition. So um, it's, it happens all the time. But what happened when the guys, for example, uh, when COVID hit, our guys weren't just boom, good morning, America. We are here. <laughs> it's so high. It's like you, you're driving by. It's like the guys so high. So what happened when, when that changed? Does it make it difficult for you to do your job or is it like an easy peasy thing? So it was very interesting in COVID because um, in 2020, everybody just froze. Oil and gas prices actually went, the oil prices went below zero for the first time in a very long time. Companies just halted all operations and what they were doing because we didn't know what to do with the pandemic. Um, so there was a very significant bounce back from that in 2021 where oil and gas prices are now at record highs and they're, they're up really far. I would say we're kind of re recession proof in the fact that when companies are not making as much money, they need to find every dollar that they can that they might have overpaid. So they'll bring us in to find extra dollars. When they are doing well and making money, they're wanting to invest and build into their processes and look prospectively better. So for us, it, it kept it kind of an even keel, but it did create a huge environment for mergers and acquisitions because of this, these price changes. You know, people who are wanting to sell an asset can get it for a premium price. But the thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize about the gas price you see at the pump is that's really determined by OPEC and the global environment and the supply and demand that it comes from international. So it really has nothing to do with our, what our day-to-day -day prices um, are for oil and gas products in the United States. It's more of a global supply and demand thing. So um, to your point, what happened during 2020 was everybody slowed down producing oil and ga gas around the world, but domestically in the United States, we did quite a bit. So then when we started producing it, you know, we were in a bit of a deficit. And so we're having to uh, have all these agreements in it. And it just kind of forces prices up with the supply and demand. So COVID did have quite a big impact on our industry. Um, but as far as what my company does, we just kind of ebbed and flowed with it. And, and some of our clients bought our other clients. And, you know, it, <laughs> it, 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 it created a lot of chaos in the oil and gas industry because of these big price swings and because of COVID. Um, but that just kind of creates more opportunity for us to have ways to help people because that, that chaos brings a little bit of disorganization that, that leaves opportunity for um, taxes to be overpaid. That makes sense. Thank you for answering that and explaining it as well because I was kind of just wondering how those, you know, Oh, my, my parents ask me the same thing. Everybody <laughs> asks me that, you know, because because it does look like it's in line. But th there's a lot of outside factors that have to do with that price at the gas pump that you see. And we don't know about it. And we complain all the time because we blame the United States and we have no clue what's going on. <laughs> it's true. And, and it's interesting because at different conferences I've been at, this has been something that, that uh, the big oil companies, CEOs and stuff, have admitted we, we don't do a very good job of communicating this, that, that everybody kind of blames us, whereas they don't realize that it, it's really the greater greater scheme of things that's going on that impacts what these prices are. And um, so I, I think that the industry as a whole doesn't, 
do a great job of, of uh, explaining that to the everyday person. Because like I said, my, my parents, my brother, I've had this discussion with any number of people, the same, one that, same questions you had. Well, I'm glad that you answered it. Hopefully that will help a lot of people understand how it works. Stop blaming the oil companies. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so um, let's say that some, uh, someone decided to start an oil and gas uh, company. Can they bring you in to help them out since you've been in the industry for so long or are you only focusing on the taxation part and that's it? So we are we are typically on the back end of things. Um, the the severance tax reporting, kind of like your personal income taxes, is done is done at the back end of your processes. So for oil and gas, there, um, you know, to to get into an oil and gas company and you decide whether you want to be an operator, a producer, just a purchaser. There's all kinds of ways to get into that. We do have some clients that are startups that we may advise on. Um, and kind of help them because with what we do, we really, we go out to the field and do field visits and see how the gas is produced and the equipment that's used because that determines whether it's exempt or not. Um, we have to look at contracts a lot. So we, we deal with the, the legal marketing department of things. We know all of the different accounting systems and the revenue and how it's booked because that feeds into the taxes. So we're able to advise on a lot of different levels of the company um, and give some input on that. But really, as far as providing savings, um, we, we help them. It's kind of on the back end of once they've produced this gas and, and sold it, then that is where the taxation occurs is on the value that you sold the product for. So that's really where our incentives come in. But a lot of them can, can go back to the drilling point. And I'll give you a perfect example is there is an exemption in Texas for wells that are drilled to a, a total vertical depth of 15,000 feet. So if somebody didn't know that um, and say they only drilled the well to 14,997 feet, hmm. if they'd gone three more feet, they could have gotten a 10-year exemption on their severance wow. tax. It could be worth $10 million. So having that knowledge when you're going in and, and an understanding of things, um, is something that we like. We're very passionate about training our clients and anybody that comes to us. And, and we do a lot of speaking events where we, we train, we try to pass our knowledge on to the industry to help people do a little bit better at that and be informed. So pretty much it's better to just reach out to someone like, like your company to get the help from the beginning instead of waiting a year or so to say, hey, I'm going to get help from a company yes, like that. that. That would be my ideal uh, is always if we can catch it at the beginning and, and do the proper planning, that is absolutely where, where we like to be. Um, you know, it, it's always a, a bummer when you go back and get refunds, you're like, yay, I got a refund. But that also means I overpaid my taxes that I didn't need to. So, you know, if you can catch it and do it correctly from the beginning, then you don't have that that swing in in uh, over or under payments. Yeah, it's worth it. I, I think it's worth it. So would you say what is the best when it's come to oil and gas company? What are the best states in the United States for it? So the, the biggest states in the United States right now in oil and gas, I would say Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, um, Oklahoma, Louisiana, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and North Dakota. That that is where our major oil and gas production is is coming from right now. A little bit and in Ohio, you, but most of your clients are coming from there. I will I will imagine as well. Yes, there are certain states that offer more exemptions and deductions than other states, and it's gonna it's gonna be very interesting next year. More states start offering more incentives legislatively to tempt people to come. Because this, this can be a significant amount of impact to the state's budget. I think that um, oil and gas severance taxes made up, I think, $12 billion of the Texas budget last year. Wow. And it's going to be even, it's going to be it totally eclipse that this year with oil and gas prices. So this is a significant state budget uh, issue. And they want, they want people coming and drilling oil and gas uh, in their state so they can generate that revenue. <laughs> I'm with them on that. <laughs> you know, th this is this is huge funding that your state legislators are using 
for your state and for your people, a lot of that is coming from oil and gas income. So, um, uh, like I said, certain states are uh, more heavily incentivizing people and, and states that have been in oil and gas a long time, like Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, may have exemptions in place where the newer states, such as Pennsylvania, West Virginia, um, North Dakota, don't have as complex and as many incentives and deductions yet. I think they will follow, I would think, because they want to stay in the competition, right? Exactly. I, I, <laughs> think, that, I think that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to put you on the spot right here in a little bit. Um, I know you, you've been in the industry for a very long time. You are very... Um, you know a lot about it, and you have a lot of knowledge to pass on to to companies. But how is Sapphire different from other similar companies in the market? That's a great question. Um, we we it, it's interesting when when people say, "Well, who are your competitors?" I say, "I don't I don't feel like we have any because I don't feel like anybody does what we do." And um, a a lot of the other companies out there that do this sort of work are very refund focused on going back and and recovering funds that have been overpaid. But where I think our difference is, is number one, our people. Um, The people on my team have an average of 20 years working in oil and gas companies. And so that's that's our average. Um, So we don't come from a place of heavy consulting. We come from a place of heavy technical expertise working in oil and gas companies and actually doing the jobs that our clients have done. So we can speak to them peer to peer as opposed to just being an outside consultant. Um, Also with that is we can really dig in and have a deeper understanding of what's going on to provide them solutions to their problems. Help with training, tax planning, education, um, passing this on to the industry. We're very transparent. We're very passionate bringing people together passing on training and knowledge. And I think that's what sets us apart from uh, what other people would consider our competition. But I think that we're doing, we're doing things in a way that no one else is. And that uh, I tell our clients sometimes, my goal is for you to not need me. I, I want to get you to a place where you feel comfortable that you are, you've recovered any refunds, you are paying everything correctly and you don't need me anymore. And that's a very backwards view for a consultant to have. Um, yes. You know, but the, the matter of the fact, the, the fact of the matter is that um, there's always going to be something new coming up because it's a dynamic industry. So, you know, I know that they're going to buy into a state they may not know about or, you know, someday when they need something, they're going to call me. And that's what's important or call, call Sapphire. And so, um, so I, I would say we have a very different viewpoint on um, how we help our clients, what our goal is. And it, it's all to better the industry because there, there really was a huge gap that we've discovered um, of people in that kind of 10 to 20 year experience range. And it came with... Um, New, you know, about 10 years ago when we had a a slump in oil, gas and oil prices, um, two things happened. A lot of people went to new accounting systems like SAP and Oracle that were more automated based because they said we're not going to need as enough people if we have uh, systems that can calculate this. Um, So they let go of a lot of people that had a lot of experience um, thinking that the system would be able to, to do that. Uh, at the same time, they also offshored a lot of stuff to, say, India or Buenos Aires and, and different places um, where they could get these um, jobs out- outsourcing it. You know, it was always a, a cost reduction thing. Um, but what happened was a lot of people, we lost a lot of knowledge. A lot of people left the industry and we outsourced or thought that a computer could do what people the could job. do. And, and people always need to make a decision at some point. So our industry finds itself with, during COVID, a lot of retirement packages went out to oil and gas people that had 20, 30 years experience. There's no one to fill their roles because the only people we've got in the industry are straight out of college or five years in because during the same time when people couldn't get jobs in oil and gas, 
they went to IT, they went to computer programming, they went other places. So we have lost not only a, a lot of knowledge in the industry, but we have nobody to replace it because they, they didn't really have anybody to train because the computers were supposed to do it or the outsourcing was supposed to do it. And, um, but that, you know, you can't outsource institutional knowledge of a company <laughs> no. or, or experience. And a lot of times the, the folks you're outsourcing it to, and there's great people out there, but they have high turnover rates and they may have two or three years experience. So you're not getting somebody with 10, 15, 20 years experience. So it's really left a, a great place for us to come in and train these people that are three to five years that don't have anybody to train them on how to get to the next level. And so we, we found a nice little niche in there where um, our knowledge base can, can really provide a lot of value. A lot. A lot. And I hope that they don't make that mistake again because computers can't replace humans. <laughs> I, I, I completely agree. But, you know, the oil and gas industry is very cyclical and it, it's crazy. I've been in this 20 years and I've, I've seen the ups and downs and, uh, you know, you can see it coming. And I'm like, I know these executives can see this coming, you know, like, but uh, it all comes down to the bottom line. And, and most of the big companies have investors they have to think of and shareholders. And sure. they're, they're trying to do something to, to maintain that. So a lot of decisions go into it, but I am with you. Like I, I see it happening and it, it still surprises me that we put ourselves in these positions, but um, I think that a lot of those companies that went to the big systems 10 years ago realized they're not capable of making the human decisions. Uh, and you need experienced people analyzing that data and that output just as much as you need a, a system that can handle it. So I think there's been some learning. I'm not sure everybody's quite learned yet, but, um, uh, you know, right now with oil and gas prices as high as they are, I just don't see that sustaining. And I feel like it's, it's going to come down. Um, whether it's I next so. year or the year after, it, it, um, it what goes up must come down. <laughs> you know, and, and it, it's just a matter of when is it going to happen. And um, there's a lot of outside forces that depend on that. Yeah, I, I do hope it comes out down because oh my goodness, oh, five dollars. <laughs> I, I know, and uh, you know, it's it's interesting because a lot of companies have gone to. Um, hybrid and work from home things. And I mean, it's, it's expensive to drive to work, especially if you're commuting. I mean, that's a huge mm -hmm. expense that you're not expecting if you're paying double for gas, what, what you need. So um, it, it's been, it's been interesting watching it, but I agree. I, I am a, a huge fan of the middle ground, like not too high, not too low. Let's just, let's just coast in the middle where everybody's cool, you know, but uh, yeah. again, we, we can't control the, the politics of the world or anything else going on. Don't even try. <laughs> so, you know, there's something I find very interesting. You don't just offer severance of tax solutions, but you offer tax success. What exactly is that? So it's, it's a little bit of what I referred to earlier of we, we want to set our clients up for success. We, we want them to not need us, to not have consultants calling them, telling them they're missing something because we want to teach them how to do it right themselves and, and to discover the little things. And, and um, a lot of times it's just digging in, finding some little trigger that wasn't flipped um, analyzing data a certain way or providing some knowledge in a state they don't know about. But everybody we deal with is smart people and they're wonderful people. And so we want to set them up for success. And, and that is our goal. <laughs> well, any piece of uh, advice for upcoming women entrepreneurs? Oh, goodness. I, I could write a book on this. Um, you know, no, nobody can ever prepare you for uh, starting your own company, running a company, having COVID hit the second year of a company, you know, you, you have to learn these lessons the hard way. I, um, I lean on every resource that I have. I listen to podcasts like y'all's. I read books. Um, I try to take in as much information from people who have done this before me that I can so that I can avoid mistakes that, that they may have made. But there's certain ones you can't avoid. You're, you're going to learn the hard way and have to do it yourself. 
Um, my, my biggest advice would be um, know what you're getting into. Be, be fully prepared if you choose that. Um, try and do as much as you can yourself. Don't, don't lean on outside investors. Don't take out heavy bank loans. You know, position yourself to a point where you can do this or start this um, at a time when you're comfortable, whether it, it fails or doesn't, that, that you can handle it. And timing is everything. Um, who you trust is important. Having good contracts is important. Um, there's, there's a lot, you know, when I've worked for companies for years, you don't think about um, the HR laws in your state, the payroll regulations that you have to deal with, you know, um, contractually, how do you create a contract and how do you protect yourself in writing a good agreement? And so I, I would say invest in the important things, um, like, like having a good attorney who can write good contracts, um, hiring good people, making sure you don't overcommit yourself, um, you know, sticking within your budget. It's kind of the same things you'd use in your personal life. You need to use in that is, um, I remember that someone told me when I was in college, if, if uh, say you want to buy a car, you go out, you shop for that car and you see, okay, that car note is $400 a month. Well, let me set aside $400 a month in a savings account for six months and make sure that doesn't cause a dent in my pocket. And then I can use that $2,400 as a down payment on the car once I know. So it's kind of that um, respect of, Make sure that it's something you can do. Don't set yourself up to fail, but also to lean on people you trust. Um, bring good people in, but try and do as much of it as you can do and outsource what you don't know how to do until you know how to do it. <laughs> well, great advice. Get help. Don't do it alone. I, <laughs> at the yes, end. Do, <laughs> do not try to do everything yourself because it's impossible. <laughs> Mission Impossible. Thank you so much, Sarah. Anything else you'd like to share with us before I let you go today? Um, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm very inspired by the movement of women right now in not just the oil and gas industry, but um, as a whole, I feel like we're coming into our own. A, a lot of women are being recognized. There's a lot of um, initiatives out there to get more women on board of directors, you know, to have more diversity in the workplace, whether it is, you know, sex, race, religion, whatever it is. And, and I'm loving this movement because it gives everybody a level playing field, which I think is all we want to deserve. But my, my last tip for women is um, you don't have to go out and start your own company if you don't feel comfortable doing it. But wherever you're at, figure out where it is you want to be and ask for it. So, you know, I, f I, I feel like as women, we sit back and, and kind of expect to be handed things that we think we deserve. Um, whereas uh, I find my male counterparts are a little more aggressive in saying what they want. I want a promotion. I want to do this. Um, I, I hope that women start standing up a little bit more and going, you know what? I, uh, I want that job. I want that role. I want that promotion. I want to raise. And here's why I think I deserve it. And to use your voice, um, because it, it is becoming more powerful nowadays. And really, we're the only ones holding ourselves back. So whatever it is and wherever you're at, just use your voice, decide what you want and go after it. Don't sit back and wait for the right time or for it to come to you. Well said, Sarah. Well said. <laughs> Thank you so much for this opportunity to have this conversation with you. I appreciate what you are doing. I feel like we need more women in oil and gas uh, industry. And I think that you are opening that door for them to be like, hey, she's doing it and I can go into and do it too. So well, stay where you so are much. and don't quit because we need <laughs> you to stay there. <laughs> I won't. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak with you. I enjoy having this conversation with Sarah. She is opening doors for other women to enter a male-dominated industry. Kudos to you, Sarah, for your hard work and success. Thank you, Sarah, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Let me know your thoughts about this episode with Sarah. And to learn more about Sarah and Sapphire Oil and Gas Consultant, visit www.sapphireogc.com. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. 
That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmel.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.